mathematicians have the propensity to be eccentric more than most people. But there was no hint that it would shade over into fully delusional, psychotic behavior. We were all aware that he had a, a great career that was shattered in a few minutes. It was a very disastrous fall of someone who was promising beyond any reasonable limit. He was so incredibly himself, so special, so unusual. He was just an oddity, and there was something sweet about it. The idea that someone who had been mentally ill and impoverished and really on the fringes of society for decades was being considered for a Nobel Prize, I thought that was amazing. Madness can be an escape. If things are not so good, you maybe want to imagine something better. In Manus, I thought I was the most important person of the world. And people like the Pope would be just like enemies who would try to uh, put me down somewhere. In September 1949, the world learned that the Soviet Union had joined the United States as a nuclear power. The shocking news intensified fears in the U.S. and put a premium on mathematicians. Mathematicians had helped win World War II. Now there was hope they could protect America's strategic edge. Princeton University boasted the most elite math department in the world. Each of its graduate students was hand-picked. That year, one stood out. A 20-year-old from West Virginia named John Forbes Nash. These young mathematicians were all pretty cocky, but he towered over them in arrogance and confidence and also in eccentricity. John Nash was always an entity unto himself. When John walked into the room, you knew that John walked into the room. I think he thought of himself as superior, intellectually, mathematically superior. We thought highly of ourselves and each other, but with John, it was double. <laughs> John just was just very clearly above it. Nash rarely attended class, claiming it would blunt his originality. He was obsessed with making a name for himself and was always on the hunt for problems that had defeated other mathematicians. There is something of that in my approach to mathematics. I, I have uh, tended to think that the thing to do is to get away from what other people are doing and not not to follow directly in any, anyone's recent work. He didn't study anything. He didn't assimilate other people's work. What he did was to try to find his own way of solving very difficult problems. And he thought he had the talent to fulfill these ambitions of being the world's greatest mathematician. Nash soon acquired a reputation for being both brilliant and odd. In the quadrangle, he rode a bicycle in figure eights, over and over, and paced the hallways obsessively whistling Bach's Little Fugue. Fine Hall is where the mathematicians met. I went there, and I looked around. I knew a number of the people, but I didn't know them all. And I thought, this is the strangest group of people in, in the world. Not only was Nash not an exception to that, but I think he was quite far off the chart. He obviously irritated some people by 
what I think they regarded as extremely eccentric behavior. He was certainly not a conformist to anyone's standard. Even as a boy growing up in Bluefield, West Virginia, deep in the Appalachian Mountains, John Nash stood out. I was in grade school and I would be doing arithmetic. I found myself working with larger numbers than other students would be using. That they, I would have several digits and they would have maybe two or three digits. <laughs> One time, one of the teachers said he couldn't do the math. It was like fourth grade. And my mother laughed because it was obviously the point was he was doing it differently. I think my parents always knew that John was bright. His father, John Sr., was an electrical engineer. His mother, Virginia, a former teacher, tutored John at home and had him skip a grade in school. One time someone suggested that I was a prodigy. Another time it was suggested that I should be called bug brains because I had ideas that were sort of buggy or not perfectly sound. He took his share of abuse from certain groups, the brain working a little bit faster than anybody else's, so everybody else felt like they had to ridicule it a little bit. His senior year in high school, John won a Westinghouse scholarship, one of only 10 awarded nationally. Three years later, he graduated from Carnegie Institute of Technology with a master's degree in math. His advisor wrote him a one-sentence recommendation. This man is a genius. The first thing that he did at Princeton, which wowed everyone and made his reputation, was he invented this game, which was known around the common room as Nash. Nash's deceptively simple game of strategy swept the math department. Before long, he applied his interest in games to a new field of mathematics called game theory. Game theory attempted to explain the dynamics of human conflict by analyzing strategies used in games. Nash was interested in everything in mathematics, but what he was really interested in were the big problems. At that moment in time, game theory was the sexy, glamorous field. If you wanted to make a splash, it was a good place to be. Just a year after arriving at Princeton, he began work on an idea that challenged the conventional thinking in game theory. Classical game theory was basically two people playing against each other, two-person game, in which if one person wins, the other person loses. Suppose you have many players. Game theory got into a phase that people couldn't really deal with it. They didn't know how to state the problem. If we could make a theoretical model that would answer questions of why do you bluff in poker? Why would you bet when you have a low hand? Why would you fail to bet if you have a high hand? If we could analyze things like that, then we could handle real-life problems in economics, in business, in politics. He had that vision. Nash's insight was another deceptively simple one. He proved that in every game, there is a best strategy for each player, given the strategies chosen by the other players. He called it the equilibrium point. In the spring of 1950, Nash presented his elegant proof. He was only 21. Years later, what became known as the Nash Equilibrium would revolutionize economics. But when it was first completed, nobody recognized its potential. Not even Nash.
After receiving his PhD, Nash moved to Boston and joined the faculty of MIT. Students called him the kid professor, but he considered himself head and shoulders above his colleagues. Basically, John was a out and out and uninhibited and shameless elitist. He was only interested in people who could operate more or less on the same mental level that he was at. He was very brash, very boastful, very selfish, very egocentric. His colleagues did not like him especially, but they tolerated him because his mathematics was so brilliant. I was thinking about a problem trying to get somewhere with it. And I couldn't, and I couldn't, and I couldn't. And I went to sleep one night, and I dreamt. I did not dream directly of a solution to that problem. Rather, I dreamt that I met Nash, and I asked him the problem, and he told me the answer. When I did finally write the paper, I gave him credit. It was not my solution. I could not have done it myself. He was part of this group of friends that Donald, my husband, had. This was a crew who were extremely competitive. And Nash was at the top of the heap. He was the best. The following year, Nash began his first serious relationship. Eleanor Steer was a shy, compassionate nurse, five years his senior. Two months after they started dating, Eleanor discovered she was pregnant. She gave birth to a baby boy and named him John. Nash refused to pay for the delivery, wouldn't even add his name to the birth certificate. Unable to support her son on her own, Eleanor was forced to place him in foster care for much of his childhood. She was pretty hurt. She was very hurt. I think she was quite fond of my father. And, you know, and uh, things didn't happen uh, the way she expected them to. The couple drifted apart. Nash kept the affair a secret. His parents and colleagues didn't even know he had a son. Not long after breaking up with Eleanor, Nash met Alicia Larday, a 21-year-old from El Salvador and one of his students. A physics major, she was one of only 16 women in a class of 800 at MIT. She was an extremely attractive girl and not American. And I somehow think that that was significant, that she was not your ordinary college girl, that she had also come from a very different place. At the time, he was a little bit like the fair-haired boy of the math department. He was, I think, considered very young for his position. And he was very nice looking, you know. When she was younger, she wanted to be another Madame Curie. John's ambition was one of the things that attracted Alicia to him. She had that desire, and she transferred it to him. 